up unicorn here with the last year of Malcolm X. The Evolution of a Revolutionary by George Brightman. You may remember when I first started uh, going live on YouTube, headless, <laughs> headless. I was, um, well, well, it wasn't this book, it was this book. So some of the first content I ever did was reading this book from front cover to back cover. Um, I may actually have um, a giveaway for this book um, and sign the inside of it. Anyhow, so um, this book is a study of Malcolm X's uh, political evolution after he left the Nation of Islam. It basically analyzes the conflicts that um, that resulted in his being driven out of the nation and his views on how to combat anti-Black discrimination, um, as he put it, uh, to basically internationalize the struggle. So one of the things Malcolm X is not popularly remembered for is taking the struggle of the African-American and internationalizing it. He kept going to DC and kept going to all these different people who are local in America. And then it just kind of dawned on him, especially once he left the oppression of the nation of Islam, he's just like, oh, we have to internationalize the struggle. So you see a Malcolm going from Egypt to uh, Arab Muslim country, to Asian Muslim country, to African Muslim country, uh, collaborating with these people. And it's so funny because the way that they would welcome him was as if he was truly the president of African Americans. They did not approach him as if he was just some kind of a political pundit or activist. They looked at him as the king of African Americans so much so they called him Al Malik, right? So here is where a discrepancy comes in for people who don't understand Arabic or for people who, well look, uh, there are over 99 names for Allah, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Al-Ghafur, um, Atawab, uh, al, al, I mean, just, just Qadaf, just, just all kind of different names, right? And one of them is Al Malik, right? So normally, when a person is a Muslim and they want to have Al Malik in their name, that they're Abdul, Abdu, Abdul Malik, right? But they weren't calling him because Malik can mean king, sovereign ruler right so they were basically calling him when they called him al malik al shabazz they were basically calling him the king of the lost tribe of shabazz they're calling him the king of the lost tribe of shabazz as a, as in he is the noble the sovereign among african americans the representative of african americans uh because here's a deal the reason I'm not impressed with uh, Hebrew Israelites saying, hey, hey, I'm Hebrew, Hebrew, because for me, it's like, well, duh, right? So some African-Americans, they sit with that and their minds are blown. But when you have a background such as mine, where you've been all over the Middle East, like Arabs know who they're looking at when they look at you. They know who you are. They know you're Semitic. They know you're a Hebrew. But my thing is, what good is it if, you know, you know, we see who has Israel, we see who has, you know, Masjid al-Aqsa and all these different uh, sacred places in terms of Israel in the middle of Palestine, right? So it, congratulations, you know who you are, but you still have no power. So yes, sure, you come from the people who, you know, we are basically the people of Moses. Um, and while in America, people will gaslight you until you... Oh, sure. Right. Of, of course you are. Of course you're Hebrews. Like all over the Arab world, they know who you are. They know who you are. They address you as who you are. You look like Moses. We have something in Islam called uh, Hilia, Hilia of the prophets. So there are these books that describe phenotypically what the prophets look like. So let's say the prophet Muhammad, for example, it's like he had pale skin, a uh, big forehead, uh, coal black eyes, right? So his eyes are not like dark hazel, how you see mine are. They were just like black, 
right? He had a uh, wavy dark hair, uh, big wide palms, soft hands, uh, medium height, right? You can go and you can see a Hilya and ancient books that are centuries old of what the Prophet Muhammad, may the blessings and peace of, peace of Allah be upon him, what he looked like. So the Hilya of Moses and Jesus, especially Moses, like Moses is described as like a dark brown copper, like not even copper, like in Arabic, when you're reading the Hilya of Musa, السلام, who you call Moses, it, um, they call him Aswad al Aswadain. Aswad al Aswadain. Aswad means black. Aswad al Aswadain, meaning he is the blackest of black. They describe his nose as broad, his lips as thick and big, his body as muscular. I mean, when you think about the way Moses must have looked. What would come into your mind when you're reading that hilya that belongs to the Muslims, that belongs, you know, to the books of Islam, you would think that you were you were being told about an African American NFL player. An African American NFL player. That is the look of Moses. And one time, um, Moses was very modest and he had a stammer, right? Like a stutter, you know, like a like a thick tongue. Um he called it a knot in his tongue. And so Aaron did a lot of talking for him. Um, and he was so modest. Uh, people thought that he was sick, you know, that there was something wrong with him. And um, rumors went on about him in Israel. So what he did was, um, or not what he did, but basically Allah caused a windstorm to blow Moses' robes away from him as he was cleansing himself. So he couldn't find it. So he came from up, on the other side of the mountain, stark naked. And when he was stark naked, you could see the cuts and the grooves and the shape of the, the thick muscles in his legs. So uh, this was a very muscular man, a very handsome man, a very physical man, a very masculine man, a very um, black man, uh, the blackest of black, Aswad al Aswadain. Okay. So, um, Anyhow, I wanted to begin reading this book, and I have some different uh, slides that I want to share. I may not share it in this show, but I definitely will eventually. Um, so I'm going to go on ahead and read, and if this microphone gets in my way at all, I'm probably going to unplug it. And if you go to my playlist, it's called Books. Right? I have a playlist called Upri Uploads. I have a playlist called Live Streams. I have a playlist called Books. And so on that playlist, I have The Alchemist. I have The Art of Seduction. I have uh, Malcolm X Speaks, which is another book by George Brightman. I have The Art of War, um, a number of books. And playing that playlist also uh, gets me paid. So uh, if you want to support my channel, the best thing that you can do is uh, put on one of my playlists and just let it go. So I'm smiling because as you open the book to the first page, there's a, there's Malcolm. There's our Malcolm. All right, so uh, the last year of Malcolm X, The Evolution of a Revolutionary by George Brightman. So I have a very Sufi background and we read four words, okay? So some people, they get a book and they skip over the four words. Um, and for me, reading the four word or the introduction is important because whoever put this book together did a whole lot of work, did a whole lot of work. So with honor and respect to the person who did the work, I uh, will now read the introduction. The present work is partly the outgrowth of another book, Malcolm X Speaks. All right, awesome. So we have Malcolm X Speaks. You see the speaks across the bottom, Malcolm X Speaks. And now we have what we're reading now. And like I said, again, Malcolm X Speaks is on my, uh, my reading list. I mean, my book playlist. 
In January 1965, George Novak, acting as a representative of Merit Publishers, visited Malcolm X in his Harlem office to propose the publication of a collection of his speeches, especially from the period after his withdrawal from the Black Muslims. So, so many people, they get, you know, whenever an African American Muslim says that they're Muslim, people naturally think, oh, Nation of Islam. No. Uh, I had someone ask me the other day, you know, what kind of a Muslim are you? And I'm like, I'm literally what Malcolm X became once he left the Nation of Islam. So bas basically like an Orthodox, traditional Sufi Muslim. Okay. Um, Malcolm responded favorably to the idea, but put off a decision until he had a chance to consult with the agent handling his forthcoming autobiography. He told Novak that one thing he would want included in the collection, even though it was not a speech, was the text of the memorandum he had submitted to the Organization of African Unity at its meeting in Cairo in July 1964. Malcolm was assassinated on February, 1st, February 21st, 1965, before any further steps were taken toward publication of his speeches. Believing that the book was now needed more than before, Merritt Publishers invited an associate of Malcolm, who had been present at the original discussion, to edit the collection, select the contents, and introduce them. He agreed and began to gather tapes of Malcolm's speeches and written text where available. Unfortunately, his other responsibilities severely limited the time he had to edit the speeches. So the publishers asked me to collaborate with them as a co-editor. I had never met Malcolm or even heard him speak in person. But I did have a keen interest in what he had been trying to do during the last year of his life. And I had given the first comprehensive speech about him after his death. With the concurrence of Malcolm's associate, I accepted the invitation. After the tapes and written material had been collected and examined, we agreed on a tentative table of contents and the transcription of the tapes began in April. Because of his other commitments, it was agreed that I would prepare the first drafts of the, prefa of the prefatory notes introducing the various speeches. In my memorial speech, I had tried to call attention to certain patterns, which I thought on the basis of the scanty evidence then available to me could be detected in the evolution of Malcolm's ideas during 1964 through 65. Now, as I went over to the tapes of almost 20 full speeches from that period, I realized with growing excitement that these patterns were indisputable. Nobody apparently had fully understood the trend of Malcolm's thought while he was alive except himself. No one but he had been present on all the occasions when he gave these speeches and most of them had not been transcribed and printed before his death. Malcolm himself had not had the opportunity to put the parts together. He was under intense pressure all of the time, exhausted most of the time, and aware that he might not have much time left. I therefore had a strong urge while writing the prefatory notes to the various speeches to comment on them, to discuss the significance of Malcolm's statements about this or that question and how they differed from developed when beyond or related to what he said about it on previous or subsequent, subsequent occasions. So uh, there's a footnote here that I want to read, and it says, this was published as a pamphlet, Malcolm X, The Man and His Ideas, New York Pathfinder, 1965. Some of its material has been incorporated into this book. But quickly, I learned that my co-editor had different opinions from mine. Like some other members of the Muslim Mosque, Inc., he believed that it had been a serious mistake for Malcolm to go into politics. In the last year, he thought Malcolm should have restricted himself to the religious sphere and concentrated on building the Muslim Mosque, Inc. 
Since our opinions were incompatible, we agreed to omit virtually all interpretive comments from the foreword and prefatory notes of Malcolm X Speaks, leaving them as factual and objective as possible. And if you want to know anything of that, again, you can check out my playlist and you'll see what they mean when they gave these prefatory notes. They're basically trying to contextualize speeches of Malcolm for you so that you're not just doing a blind read so that you know, you know, oh, he was in front of this audience and at this place and this had just happened. His house was just bombed and he had just come back from Cairo and and from that. Right. They they gave you those kind of prefatory notes. Okay. <laughs> Since our opinions were incompatible, we agreed to omit. Okay, I read that already. Then, just as the editorial work on the book was being completed in June, Malcolm's associate felt that he had to withdraw from the project, and I was left as the sole editor. That's good news. I would have liked at that point to revise and expand my editorial notes, but the publishers wanted to get the book out as soon as possible and would not wait, so they were printed in their original form. The present work, a year later, is an expanded version of what I would have liked to do in the notes to Malcolm's speeches. It also contains material I did not have access to at the time. I think that Malcolm X speaks, speaks for itself. An attentive reader can derive from it most of the conclusions that are presented in this work. What I have tried to do here is make it easier to grasp the connections and implications of the various parts. The last year of Malcolm X was also stimulated by the publication of the autobiography of Malcolm X. You know, I, I read that book, The Autobiography of Malcolm X, when I was in uh, Yemen. It's so funny that it was in America all that time, but it was when I ended up in Yemen in the back of a, <laughs> a mountain in the Valley of Hadramaut that I had the time to read The Autobiography of Malcolm X. And I just I just couldn't put it down. It's uh, it's Alex Haley's redemptive work, because in all honesty, Alex Haley plagiarized uh, the Conte Kente story and uh, paid big bucks for it. Anyhow, it says. Um, the autobiography is a very valuable work, indispensable for those who want to understand Malcolm and Grove Press deserves thanks for publishing it after Doubleday which had commissioned its writing, abandoned it following Malcolm's ass assassination. But while it contains much material not available elsewhere, it is not the definitive work on Malcolm that it might have been. Malcolm was not a writer. He told his autobiography to Alex Haley. Because Haley did not sympathize with his views, Malcolm stipulated that nothing be in the book that he had not said and that nothing be left out that he wanted in it. The actual writing and arrangement of the material were done by Haley. As Malcolm had predicted, he did not live to read the full and vinyl version. He was killed on the weekend when he had planned to visit Haley's home for a final reading of the manuscript. Haley appears to have honored Malcolm's stipulation to the best of his ability and understanding, but his political understanding was, as I.F. Stone put it, conventional. Right. So imagine the person who wrote uh, the autobiography of Malcolm X was Alex Haley, and he had conventional politics as opposed to Malcolm was a radical. So clearly Alex Haley was in opposition to Malcolm. But it just goes to show you that you can differ with people on the deepest of subjects. But when you come correct and with respect, there's so much you can accomplish. Even after the split, he did not fully grasp the changes in Malcolm's outlook, which took place with great speed in the final month in the final months. And the book does not adequately reflect these changes. It really doesn't. I read it. I read I read that one, that one, and now this one. It really doesn't. Um, the total effect is somewhat blurred. Furthermore, because originally this was to be the story of Malcolm, the black Muslim. The first dedication was to Elijah Muhammad and the royalties were to go to his organization. Oof. It was begun early in 1963, a full year before Malcolm's break 
with the Black Muslims in March 1964, and a large part, perhaps most, of the material was told and written down before the split. If it had been published then, it would still have been a fascinating narrative, but along strictly orthodox Black Muslim lines. Uh, there was a lot of silencing of Malcolm, uh, quite literally, by uh, the Black Muslims, uh, the Nation of Islam, and particularly uh, Elijah Muhammad himself. After the split with Muhammad and Malcolm's first trip abroad in the spring of 1964, he and Haley added some material to the book. And in December 1964, after his second longer trip to Africa, they added a little more. Now I'm gonna read this footnote to you. It says, a condensed version of an early draft of the autobiography was printed in the Saturday Evening Post of September 12, 1964. This was at a meeting in Paris on November 23rd when Malcolm was asked a question about passage and this version about a passage in this version concerning black, concerning black Muslim doctrine. He said it was wrongly worded by the writer. So when you're reading the autobiography of Malcolm X and you come across certain things, you literally have Malcolm at a meeting saying about something he was asked about. Um, concerning black Muslim doctrine, it says it was wor it was wrongly worded by the writer. So oftentimes when you have a person writing about you who doesn't sympathize with your views, they can say things wrong. It's like having an extreme Christian write a book about Islam. They might say something really nasty and really wrong and really horrible and make the religion look, you know, a way that it really is not, but it's because they have an aversion to it. So Alex Haley def uh, had a political aversion to the nation of Islam and all these, I mean, look up Alex Haley, okay? So he and Haley added some material to the book and in December, 1964, after his second longer trip to Africa, they added a little more. Only the report of the split in Malcolm's first trip to Mecca and Africa can be regarded as adequate. His second and longer trip gets very little space and there is almost nothing in Malcolm's part of the autobiography about the crucial last three months of his life, which was when his ideas were developing most rapidly. Despite the thousand under other things he was trying to do, Malcolm wanted to make changes in the book. Beginning soon after the split, he let Haley talk him out of it. <coughs> Haley reports in his epilogue that Malcolm would frown and wince as he read parts of the manuscript Haley let him see, right? So when Malcolm was reading through what became the autobiography of Malcolm X, he was like, okay, frowning and wincing at the work Alex Haley did. That upsets me. Um, but in the end, he kept his word to Haley and did not insist on rewrite, rewriting. Haley says that Malcolm wanted to alter or delete favorable statements about Muhammad, uh, Elijah Muhammad. I hate that they're not putting Elijah Muhammad in that they're just writing Muhammad. Um, you know, Elijah Muhammad's name is actually Elijah Poole. Poole. And there's no reason to doubt that this was part of what Malcolm wanted to change. But since we know about the new ideas that Malcolm was beginning to express publicly, especially after May, 1964, ideas that were at variance with some of the some, some written earlier for the autobiography, and not just ideas about Muhammad, but political ideas, it is likely Malcolm also wanted to revise some of the general formulations and even concepts which are so, pre which are so presented in the autobiography that they can be mistaken for the ideas of his last months, which they no longer were. So you have a lot of things that were going on in the autobiography of Malcolm X that were written and you see it sum up the end of his life, but in reality, those things that they're putting on the same timeline at the end of his life, they're not things that he believed in anymore. They're not things he believed in anymore. Malcolm would say things like white people cannot help black people in their struggle. In the last few months of his life, he believed that white people could. Uh, Malcolm believed in combining with different religious groups now, as opposed to just hanging out with, you know, the nation of Islam and how they were the only people with any answers, right? He, um, he became more well-rounded and more practical in his beliefs. 
Um, and the autobiography really doesn't give you all of that. But when you read these couple of books, along with the autobiography, you see it start to make sense. And what the saving grace of that is, is that we were able to see Malcolm give these very public speeches about how he felt, you know, once he came back from Mecca and he drank from the same cup of men with the whitest of white skin and the bluest of blue eyes and the blondest of blonde hair. And he realized that, you know, there is a cure for the hatred in the heart of a racist. And one of those cures he believed, or the cure he believed, was uh, the true practice of Islam. Uh, I'm not proselytizing. I do not uh, care to make converts or anything like that. I'm just saying, I'm, I'm just quoting my Malcolm uh, because I care. Um, trying to find my spot. In his epilogue, Haley does in at least one place what Malcolm probably wanted to do in many. He quotes the position on intermarriage that Malcolm adopted toward the end of his life, which was radically different from the one expressed in the middle of the book. But a gap remains in the work as a whole on other more basic questions. Ooh, excuse me. Consequently, the autobiography, even with Haley's long epilogue, is politically incomplete and in some ways ambiguous or misleading, as in the insertion in the last chapter entitled 1965, of a paragraph about revolution that clearly belongs to an earlier phase of Malcolm's development. The present work is in part an effort to add what was missing or muted in the autobiography of Malcolm X and to clarify some of the ambiguities, thus providing the basis for a balanced judgment. The last year of Malcolm X, the book we're reading, is dedicated to the young black freedom fighters of our country, whom Malcolm counted on. Malcolm really believed in them and really relied on the youth. Whom Malcolm counted on to lead their people in a successful struggle for equality. They already know or sense that Malcolm was an incorruptible and uncompromising revolutionary. They can only benefit from learning more about the ideas he had reached and the problems he was still grappling with at the time of his death. This was written um, Detroit, Michigan, June 1966. Now I wanna say this when it comes to being incorruptible. Uh, both Martin and Malcolm, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X, their phones were tapped, their hotels tapped, white vans outside spied on. They found out, and here's the deal, because Martin Luther King is no less important to me with uh, what I'm about to say. They found that uh, Martin was cheating regularly on Coretta. Scott King was uh, sleeping with multiple women, uh, especially in his church, whereas um, Malcolm didn't touch a woman who wasn't Betty. And when I say didn't touch, I, shaking hands, like literally. All the phone conversations the FBI, CIA, COINTELPRO has on this guy wasn't even on the phone with another woman. So when they say incorruptible, that's what they mean. And to his last breath, everything he said, everything he did, he practiced what he preached. Everything you could take to the bank, cash it. This is why Malcolm is so important. He proves that, I mean, not all of us have to be goofy. Not all of us have to be whack, uh, sub-rate, sub-par, hypocritical leaders, narcissists. We can, we can really do this. And COINTELPRO has uh, this thing where they're after black messiahs. So the Fred Hamptons of the world and the Huey P. Newtons of the world and the Malcolms of the world and the Medgar Evers of the world, they get assassinated. So if you want to know why we're not producing any more of these men, it's not just because they're in single parent households. It's because it, it has been very uh, obvious to us that it's, uh, it means your life. And creating the heart of a martyr at this time in American history is um, rare. 
So we're already half an hour in and I would prefer for this to be a series with half an hour increments because I want people to be able to sit through them. So um, let me see how long this lives. You can just hang on with me. <laughs> Money order. Okay, yeah, it's quite long. So what I'm going to do is move that money order to the first chapter of the book. We've read the intro, and now we know how to respect and appreciate George Brightman, the man who put this together, the man who put this together, the man who is helping us to complete what we have read of the autobiography of Malcolm X. I love that you said this because you're carrying on um, something that we mentioned yesterday. Malcolm truly did the shadow work. He truly had to look at himself and say, I'm a pimp, I'm a pusher, I'm a player, I'm a this, I'm a that. And he had to do the work. Stuck in a jail cell. Stuck alone with his own thoughts. And with his own character and who he was. And he had to make that change that Michael Jackson sings about in The Man in the Mirror. Malcolm, notorious for shadow work. The epitome, the, the African-American cultural epitome of shadow work. I believe that this is why so many African-American men, you know, they want credit for coming out of jail and they're like, oh, I'm woke now. And, and they pretend to be these hoteps because people like Malcolm really did that. They really lived that life. They really went in, you know, the worst of the worst and came out the best of the best. He's a true example of that. Now there are people who are faking trying to claim that kind of glory. And, and in reality, they're just, you know, prison scholars, you know, scamming people, whatever it is. But he really hit rock bottom in every single way. And the Muslims believe that he was martyred. Uh, that when he was murdered, he was martyred. So... One time, Betty Shabazz went to Saudi Arabia and the Arabs begged her to stay because to them, they had a queen among them because she was married to the Malik of African-Americans. She was married to the king of the lost tribe of Shabazz. And she herself, when she died, she was also martyred. And this is the highest station of a death. This is the best death, uh, according to Islam, that, that any Muslim can have. But basically, uh, her grandson, I believe it was, set their house on fire. He was trying to, he wasn't trying to hurt her. I think he was trying to scare her with her PTSD and something she had been through in order to, like, I think he just wanted to get out of the house and she was being stripped. And when she saw that fire, she walked through the fire to save him and died that way on fire, asking for water was the last thing that came out of her mouth. So um, I can't promise you that this is going to be the most glamorous read or the most comfortable read, but um, Malcolm X is one of those ancestors that should shame on you as an African-American specifically if you don't honor him. So this is a way to pay homage and to show respect to you, our ancestors. So forgive me for not verbally shouting you out, but the recording must stay short. I'm at 35 minutes now. And um, I thank you for supporting the channel and supporting me, uh, putting good content, wholesome, non-problematic content onto YouTube. I'm up at Unicorn. And this is the last year of Malcolm X. How long was I on mute? I hope I wasn't on mute for too long. Anyhow, I'm uppity in the mouth.